Hi, this is Kristen Bell, and this is my brief history of zero. So, zero is perhaps the most complicated number, well, aside from infinity, but it turns out zero and infinity might be two opposite sides of the same coin. So, we'll start off the story with the history of zero. For a good part of human history, people never wrote down the number zero. It, is, it sort of didn't exist. It is hard to imagine that, though, as we are so comfortable with our friend zero now. The first numbers in history seem to have been counting tools like tally marks. People had a need for counting sheep or deer or maybe even themselves, but they didn't really need to count zero people, sheep or deer, so zero wasn't there. So is that like a meta zero, the absence of zero? I don't know. One of the first civilizations to record zero it wasn't called that name, was the Mayan civilization in what is now called southeastern Mexico and northern Central America. As far as we know, the Mayans didn't have contact with the European world before colonization, so this concept of zero essentially arose separate from the east. Meanwhile, in the area around Egypt, circa 300 BCE, the Babylonians, who used sexagesimal base 60 system, decided that they really needed something akin to zero to be a placeholder. So they came up, came up with two slanted wedges that represented empty space. Again, it wasn't really zero as we know it today. It was more of a placeholder of empty space rather than anything else, but embodied some of the aspects of what we would come to know as zero. The Greeks enter the picture and really take a lot of knowledge from the Egyptian, not the Babylonian, but Egyptian culture, including knowledge about numbers. While the Greeks were arguably good with numbers, they did not like the idea of zero, so they basically pretended like zero didn't exist. It is kind of strange to think of math in this way now, but it was really a, philosoph a philosophical topic back in ancient Greece and Rome, so everything had to do with big ideas like whether or not there was a god, or how the universe was created, and how the world existed. The Greeks and Romans balked at the idea of nothingness and infinity. It shook them to their core, so they chose not to even entertain zero. Besides that, they were using Egyptian number systems, and since the Egyptians were mainly measuring real-world things, like land when the Nile flooded and receded, they didn't have much use for zero either. The Greeks and Romans were happy to outlaw zero to the realm of nothingness. In fact, one of the most famous cults of math, the Pythagoreans, really hated dealing not only with zero, but also with irrational numbers, so they killed people who even mentioned them. That is some harsh math right there. There were other cults like the atomists, who thought that things broke down into tinier and tinier parts, yes, atoms, but what really stuck in European civilization were the views of Aristotle. Aristotle was anti-atom and anti-zero, so Europe continued on without zero for quite a while. It was a problem, though, because calculations weren't exactly correct, and calendar making was weirdly off-kilter. However, India was not afraid of the void of nothing that zero represented, nor were they afraid of the infinite. Their Hindu religious beliefs allowed them to embrace the knowledge brought by Alexander the Great and others, which included some things from Babylonia, Greece, Rome, and other parts of Egypt. They ultimately embraced zero and made it more than just a placeholder. They used zero with their base 10 system that was roughly based on the ideas of the Babylonian system. And in essence, the Indian numbers are the root of the numbers we know today. The Indians didn't quite know what to make of zero exactly, but they did use it to turn math into something a lot more than counting. They were able to envision the number line, negative and positive numbers, and they began to manipulate numbers simply by writing them, which was a precursor to algebra. While Greece and Rome had fallen in the West during this time, India flourished until the Muslims came into power after Muhammad in the 7th century CE. The Muslims conquered India, and they absorbed the knowledge they had there. A guy named Muhammad ibn Musa al karamazi was the star mathematician of the time. al karamazi is where we, get our, where we get algebra and algorithms from. 
The Muslims knew all sorts of cultures because they conquered a large area. They knew about Aristotle and his hatred of zero. They knew about the Adamus and the Hindu Indian number, numbers. Ultimately, while Europe continued to side with Aristotle, the Muslims chose to acknowledge the Adamus and zero. In the 10th century CE, a large Jewish group settled in Islamic Spain because Caliph Abd al Rahman III encouraged intellectuals from Babylonia to come over. The early medieval Jews were also in Camp Aristotle, but this view of the world conflicted with Jewish theology. Enter Mamondes, a 12th century CE rabbi. He got rid of the idea of the void being godless and confounding, and basically said that God had created the universe from nothing. After that, it took a long while for the views of Aristotle to fall completely out of favor, but numbers, including zero, had suddenly become the stuff of the divine. Christianity still tried hard to reject zero, but the Christian's love of trade made zero into a real live number. As the medieval times closed up, the European Renaissance fell in love with zero and infinity. First, zero and infinity were used in art and architecture, and then they moved into the sciences, especially astronomy. In the 16th and 17th centuries CE, there were a lot of philosophical wars going on. This was also post Martin Luther and his theses, and the church had been split in two. The Catholic Church tried to still reject zero, but it couldn't because zero was everywhere and in everything. All of this took place even before calculus enters the picture. I'll end this summary here because after this point, zero really becomes a superstar and is never really questioned as important and valid again. This is just the beginning of the story of zero. In the next section of zero, I'll look at some of the ways that zero shows off its fancy self. This section will give you a little glimpse into calculus. There's really so much more that involves zero, but I can't cover it all here. We really could start with various people, but I'll begin with Copernicus, who showed that the Earth is not the center of the universe. Instead, he said the Sun was. Copernicus published his ideas in 1543, just before he died, but it shook the boots of the Catholic Church. The Church pushed back, and a lot of stuff happened, but yada yada yada, in the 17th century, Johannes Kepler took up Copernicus's mantle. Remember, this was all a lot of fighting about the origins of the universe and what God was and what God was capable of doing. Copernicus, <laughs> Copernicus and Kepler were saying that the earth was not the center, which made people question if God in the universe could be born of nothingness, aka zero. Needless to say, Copernicus and Kepler won out. Soon enough, other people who were influenced by Copernicus, Copernicus and Kepler would invent calculus. Of course, we are talking about Newton and Leibniz. But at the core of calculus, we have big hair. Oh, I mean division by zero and adding infinite zeros together. How peculiar and illogical. Okay, so let's start with an example of an infinite series. Consider um, 1 minus 1 plus 1 minus 1 plus 1 minus 1. You get the idea. This all sums to zero. It is the same thing as zero plus zero plus zero plus zero forever, but the but group the series in a different way and it becomes one plus negative one plus one plus negative one plus one, etc., which clearly sums to one. The same series has two answers. You can do the same thing with any number. Just put the number instead of one, so five instead of one. So adding infinite things gives bizarre results. Sometimes the adding together approaches a number and other times it goes to infinity. So re-enter Kepler. He was working on making a better wine barrel and he wanted to estimate the largest volume so he cut the barrel into tiny tiny pieces. We can imagine, more clear, imagine it more clearly by estimating the size of a triangle and putting tiny rectangles inside the triangle. The triangle has a height of 8 and a base of 8. Since the area of a triangle is half the base times height, the area is 32. First, we put some bigger rectangles in and get the volume. It isn't very close, but the smaller the rectangles are, the closer we get to the actual volume. 
making smaller and smaller rectangles, essentially delta x going to zero, makes the volume closer and closer to its true value. The sum of these little rectangles is just the integral, um, integral f of x dx. So what's the problem here? As delta x goes to zero, the sum is equivalent to adding an infinite number of zeros together. This makes no sense. So when things make no sense, what do mathematicians do? Yes, we ignore it. Interestingly, these zero sections gave insight into the tangent line. The tangent line is important for motion and physics. What we are interested in here is the slope of this tangent line. Let's say you have a car and its position is represented by a curve. Then the slope of that tangent line tells you how fast the car is going at that point. But slope is delta y over delta x. We want the point on the line that just gives us zero. or we can say delta y over delta x approaches zero over zero, but that has no meaning, right? So Newton used a notational trick to get to the root of the problem. So Newton's notation is a little different than the calculus of today, but here we go, I'll try to make it work. <laughs> so Newton was saying that x and y can change, and their rates of change are y dot and x dot. I've put a kind of slash over the top to make it stand out a little bit more. But And you let x and y change, but only a super, super tiny bit. So you get, for the rate of change, you get y plus this uh, zero that's not exactly zero times y dot and x plus this weird zero that's not zero times x dot. So let's say you have an equation for a line that the car is driving on or something. And that equation is y equals x squared plus x plus 1. With Newton's calculus, it turns into y plus, I'll just call the zero thing not, and y dot equals x plus not x dot squared plus x plus not x dot plus 1. Okay, so then you multiply out the x plus not x dot squared, and I'll just let you look at what it looks like because I keep getting tongue-tied, and then you rearrange it, and since, uh, and then you get that equation <laughs> that's there on the screen, and since y equals x squared plus x plus 1, you can subtract y from the left side and x squared plus x plus 1 from the right side. So this gives us not y dot equal to 2x times not x dot plus 1 times not x dot plus not x dot squared. Okay, so remember Newton said that not x dot was really, really, really small. So obviously, not x dot squared is even smaller. And basically, we can throw it out because it's too small. So that leaves not y dot equal to 2x times not x dot plus 1 times not x dot. You rearrange that, and you get not y dot over not x dot equal to 2x plus 1 which is the slope of the tangent line at any point x on the curve. Voila! Calculus exists! So basically, Newton used zero kind of illegally, but not exactly, and it worked. And he toyed with zero and infinity, and no one could really reject what he did. And Leibniz comes along later, but we don't have really time, time for him, so there really is so much more to the story, but this is just where I'll leave off. I encourage you to check out the book Zero, The Biography of a Dangerous Idea, by Charles Seife for more fascinating information and more about how zero breaks all the rules. Thanks so much for listening and have a good day.